Hello and welcome to this, our fifth episode of Pillow Talk with Core. My name is Eamon McGann and I'm the Client Solutions Director at Core. I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Sayre today. Uh, Paul is the Head of Public Sector at Core and together we're going to be talking about secure remote working, particularly in the public sector. So welcome, Paul. Um, do you mind if I get a brief introduction of who you are, your role and, and kind of what you do at Core? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, as you said, uh, so I'm Paul Sauer. I look after the public sector team at Core. Uh, I look after uh, directly all of our uh, major relationships with our central government customers, and I also support uh, my colleagues who look after the other sub verticals that we look after in public sector. So, we're predominantly strong in central government, local and regional government, NHS, education, and not for profits. Uh, so, as a team, uh, we uh, we equate to about half of Core's annual revenues. Um, and we have a very strong presence in uh, on the G Cloud framework. So we've been uh, one of the top SME providers for a number of years. Cool. So Paul, as, as you know, um, so it's no surprise here, the, this episode is uh, based on CORE's recent survey um, on sleep patterns of IT professionals. Um, and one of the key points that we looked at through, through the survey was some of the strains and stresses that IT professionals go through. Um, and no real surprise, although this was done pre-COVID, uh, no real surprise, security was the number one um, thing that, uh, that, came, that came out of the survey, with 54% suggesting that it was kind of one of the key stresses and strains that they go through day to day. Um, I think that was looking in context of back in January or February. If we look at now, uh, and we look at really how explosive secure mode um, working has, has has been over the last few months. Really, I'm keen really in the next small while to get your thoughts and experience of the impact that that's had on our colleagues in the public sector. You, know, you and I are talking to them on a daily basis and, and we're hearing the stresses and strains. But I also think what, what I want to try and do really to be to be straight up on this is be practical about just the simple things that we're seeing that people are doing to, to do the dual job of getting secure remote out there, but also giving that peace of mind that they can sleep at night and that the, the environment is secure. So, you know, that's kind of, kind of the key focus of the session this morning. Um, just for, for, for housekeeping, um, the, the survey that I mentioned is available on our website, so we'll be putting the link up now. Um, it was an independent piece of research we did, and for me, it was a very, very interesting piece of research, some very, very interesting insights. So. I'd highly recommend you download it. And as I said, the link is, is, is available on site. Uh, so, Paul, I mean, my first question really is around the concept of more with less. And in the public sector, that's not a new concept. Uh, and I know I believe it started with uh, David Cameron's government some time ago. Um, but really reflecting on the current situation, um, you know, we, we've got CISOs and, and CIOs uh, in, in both the commercial and public sector. Um, that have, are really having to, to come up with some miracles in, in the last um, couple of weeks. Uh, you know, we're seeing rollouts, uh, and one of my personal friends who's, who's a security officer, you know, he's having to do an awful lot more with furloughed staff and, and some crazy stuff. So he's achieving goals that he would have normally had months and months and months to, 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 to achieve, and he's just not had that now. So from your perspective, Paul, what impact have you seen in the public sector in terms of supporting this explosive um, remote working uh, in a world where actually they're having to do that with some real commercial constraints? They are, yeah. And I mean, I think um, so. If we if we wind back to what you were saying to start off with, obviously, yeah, do more uh, do more with less was was one of the things that came out when we had the switch of government in 2011. Um, and interestingly, it, part of that do more with less agenda and part of the Part of the, the perceived solve for that was actually cloud and cloud-based services. So um, G Cloud was born out of actually part of that overall uh, agenda, something something called the Efficiency and Reform Group uh, that worked with Cabinet Office and uh, HM Treasury. Uh, so I, I, funny enough, I actually worked for that group at, at that time. So I was working for the government for a couple of years while that, that transition was going over. So uh, interestingly, the do more with less is very much about trying to adopt the cloud technology. Um, and it's really interesting uh, to talk to different customers who and explore their experience, this sudden change in working that we've had over the last few months. So those that had really adopted the cloud technology um, have actually found they've had a much um, a much easier transition actually into, you know, suddenly enabling lots and lots of people to work from home. Um, it's, um, uh, you know, if we use core as an example, uh, you know, we literally on the 18th of March decided that we were going to close the office for the, you know, the protection of, of, of all of our employees before the government lockdown took place. 
So everybody went home on the 18th and on the 19th, they started working from home. And that was the that was the depth of our transition. You know, we carried on doing everything that we were doing. Um, so, you know, organizations that had adopted that approach and that have sought to do more with less um, have actually weathered the storm a little bit better. Um, and, you know, ultimately have had an easier transition into this new working from home piece. The ones that um, so we we had about eight different uh, projects that were waiting to kick off uh, when uh, sort of at the beginning of March this year uh, with different customers um, who ultimately all of them got slowed down a little bit because they had to make some emergency adjustments to, you know, obviously to um, uh, to try and get some form of working from home, uh, you know, some form of working from home operating. Um, and it was really interesting because lots of different customers had lots of different experiences. Uh, so one of the customers we were working with took six or seven weeks uh, of, of literally just firefighting and dealing with different issues in order to enable their workforce to work remotely. So almost the majority of what they've been through on lockdown, they spent firefighting and trying to get things, uh, you know, trying to get things in place. Whereas a lot of customers, you know, only had one or two weeks worth of time to, to you know, or only required one or two weeks uh, to move from their on-premise kind of mindset into, uh, you know, into a, a working from home type of environment. So, um, you know, ultimately, I think, um, you know, the the message of do more with less uh, not only helps organisations to keep their costs under control and obviously to make the budget stretch further by not having people racking and stacking equipment when you can buy a cloud service that's done that for you. But it also means that when things like this happen, they've, they've had a much easier job. They have required less human resources to actually move into that new working environment. OK. And, and can maybe as an, as an extension to, to that question, um, and, 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 and you know, maybe just from my own personal experience, I know working with Microsoft, um, who have been very engaging to try and, and get security out there. You know, it, ultimately they've stood up to the plate from my perspective, and, and working with them as a partner, try to work with us across a number of sectors, both public sector and education, around saying how can we enable schools, how can we enable diff different organisations. I think one of the key things that Microsoft have been working with me and, and, and the team on is, you know, let's look at what the customer has. Let's look at the kit bag of active stuff they have and let's let's try and get that stuff enabled. Um, and I think we'll, we'll probably come back to some of that later. But from a personal experience, one of the key things that came out was the security defaults, um, which is a kind of rebadge to some of the baseline conditional access stuff that Microsoft have in M365. Um, we've definitely been working with some customers to ensure that they have that um, based on experience and I think the link to really what you were talking about is particularly for those that are early cloud cloud adopters or not quite you know I think your, your point was the experience of those that are cloud enabled was, was a more seamless one though that are new to it you know security defaults really are some of the kind of key things that help that journey and just gave that peace of mind and um, have you have you in terms of just some of that basic stuff and I, I know I'll come back to maybe in a wee while but has that been your experience also? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so uh, one of the one of the challenges that customers have faced, and I mean, obviously, we've got I've got this direct experience from public sector customers, but we know that there are customers in in the private sector and in lots of other you know lots of other areas that have got the same issues. Um, a lot of what they've historically built their solutions around is is based around a a very much an on premise type model, um, and as a result of which, a lot of the security that they're looking to leverage onto their remote users is based on appliances in the office. So at the end of the day, the, some of, most of the challenges that organisations have had is how do we get devices that we might not have corporately issued connected into our network so that they can use the email hygiene solutions or our web filtering solutions that we absolutely require our users to, to operate within um, so that we can meet our obligations or our policies in the organisation. And that does bring back to the, the more with less conversation. Most of these customers have got sufficient Microsoft 365 licensing that would enable them to have all of those services delivered in their current license. So instead of using Zscaler for web filtering, they could actually use the Azure based uh, web filtering solution that's part of their Microsoft 365 licensing. Instead of using uh, Mimecast for email hygiene, they could use the advanced threat protection solutions that are sat in their licenses. They're already paying for them. They're right there. It just requires a little bit of deployment. Um, and actually, if they did it, they could not only solve some of the challenges they've got with trying to make people work remotely and you know use the corporate network as a junction point to get out to all the other services that they're consuming. They've also got the opportunity to make structural cost savings. You don't need to buy that license for that 
you know, uh, email hygiene solution. You don't need to buy the license for that web filtering solution. You don't need the hardware. You don't need the maintenance. You don't need the support and the upgrades. Um, you can actually get rid of all that stuff. Um, and what you can have is a much actually more flexible, much more useful solution for people who aren't in the office um, that will work with them, whatever they do in the web. Um, but and also obviously, you know, make some savings and, and reduce some of the reliance on people being in the office, which is the other key thing. If your Zscaler appliance that's on premise goes down, that means nobody can access the web until somebody goes into the office and fixes it. Whereas with the cloud, it's resilient. And ultimately, uh, if something does happen to the infrastructure, it will get switched uh, and, and it will be up and running again without you having to actually deploy the resources. So, um, you know, I think that's all, uh, all quite key. And I know... Um, I know there's been a couple of reports that have been uh, released recently that have kind of gone into some of that stuff and, and highlighted where, uh, you know, maybe organisations aren't making the most out of the the, the stuff that's baked into their um, uh, the stuff that's baked into already into their licensing packages. So, yeah, I think you, you brought up a very interesting point for me uh, and kind of takes me into my next kind of topic because, you know, if there's an element of trust in Microsoft as a technology, um, as, as particularly as a security provider. And, and you know, it's, this is open for a fair bit of debate, but Microsoft really is now seen as a trusted security provider. And, and I'm basing that statement on a couple of facts. One, Forrester, um, in, in their Forrester wave for enterprise detection and response, put them as a leader, put them actually at the top right-hand corner of their Forrester wave back in, in March, I believe. Um, and one of the senior research directors of Forrester, a chap called Joseph, Blank, uh, Joseph Blankenship, he made a lovely comment to effectively the the uh, the security community saying, you know, guys, it's now time to take off the tinfoil hat and realize that Microsoft is a security company. So really, really highlighting the security. And, and what he was picking up on particularly was zero trust. So the model that the old school of um, perimeter and, and so on, while it's important, really we need to look at now the perimeter, the endpoint and the data. So, so I think, you know, fundamentally zero trust is Microsoft's model. Um, but even with that model, the world has changed over the last eight weeks or so. So from your perspective, and I know you talk about this a lot when we're talking to customers, you know, based on the current situation, zero trust, how we apply it and, and kind of what's changed in zero trust, you know, what's your, what's your thoughts on how CIOs are having to grapple with that over the last kind of eight weeks or so? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, this is the uh, I think the current um, the current challenges that people have got around uh, COVID-19, um, you know, underline all of the things that we've been saying to customers for some time now. I mean, Core's been working with customers and promoting a zero trust model since I think it was 2013. It certainly predates my time at Core. But I know um, I know we've got some solutions uh, that have been in place since the very early days of Office 365, where we've gone down to a, uh, a zero trust or an almost zero trust type model. Um, but I mean, I think, um, again, winding, I suppose, winding the, the, the question back a little bit. Um, two years ago, if, if we'd have gone out to a customer and said, hey, you know, Microsoft have got some really good security offerings, um, we, A, we probably wouldn't have felt comfortable having that conversation with a customer, and B, the customer would probably have thrown us out on the street. So, um, you know, Microsoft, in terms of their capability around security, has grown exponentially over the last couple of years. Um, and we've done, I mean, we, we, we did a webinar as core last week where we were talking about um, uh, some of the changes uh, sort of around the security stack for remote workers and how we cope with the, the new normal. And, and, you know, one of the things we called out there was the model has changed. Two years ago, Microsoft was a net consumer of security information. They would buy in information from law enforcement agencies and from, uh, you know, third party providers. So the McAfee's and Kaspersky labs of this world in order to try and, put, uh, and, and shore up their systems. Um, that model has, has gone on its head. And because of the amount of stuff that Microsoft are doing in, in Office 365 and the other cloud platforms, they're now actually collecting much more usable data and, and intel uh, than anybody else on the planet. And, and now they're actually selling their data back to those companies that were feeding them, you know, uh, feeding them the data historically. So, the, I mean, the whole Microsoft security story has turned on its head. Um, and I think what that's done ultimately is it's driven the capability of delivering a zero trust model. Um, it's driven it so much further forward than it was even, you know, seven years ago when we first started doing some of this stuff with customers. Um, you know, we are now um, in a position to offer a no compromise alternative to that old perimeter security model. So, you know, the, the perimeter security model is probably what IT has been basing its security approach on for 40 years. Um, you know, let's, 
we you know we'll build our little walled wall garden we'll we'll put up all the fences around it and we'll make sure that access into that walled garden is very limited but we'll you know that inside that walled garden anything goes and that's fine until you have people who have to sit outside the walled garden and have to come back into it and that's where the you know certainly leveraging the technology that's available in the microsoft 365 stack um, and looking at how you can really kind of redefine or re-engineer the servicing for, uh, you know, a modern workplace world. Uh, you know, uh, we always talk about the modern workplace and about how work is something you do rather than somewhere you go. Um, and that is now reality for a lot of organisations in the private and in the public sector. Um, you know, it's not a case of going to the office and logging in. It is a case of you have to work from wherever you can be. You might be working with a device that's not a corporate issue device where, we don't know what the hygiene on that device is. It could be loaded with ransomware or malware. We just don't, you know, we don't know. It's somebody's home machine. Um, it might not even be on a current operating system. So, you know, ultimately, um, why would we levy any trust to that machine or to anything that's on the network it's connecting from? You just wouldn't uh, because you can't trust it. Um, so what we have to do is look at, okay, how do we, how do we protect our systems and how do we protect our cloud platforms um, from a, uh, a threat that could actually exist on the device that our users are using. And that's where the zero trust piece really comes into play and, and making sure that we, uh, you know, ultimately the cornerstone to zero trust is having a good identity and access management policy um, and making sure that we're doing everything we can to protect the way that a user accesses the services. So if we can do something that doesn't require passwords, that's definitely a win because who knows, there could be key logging software on the machine that might actually catch that password. So. Um, leveraging features like Windows Hello, where we can use a pin on a device instead of actually entering our uh, the password for our username, um, is one great way of, of providing a we're, we're demonstrating zero trust in the device that the user is using. Um, but then also, um, you know, we're in a BYOD world. Uh, you know, we're in a world where unless you've spent as an organisation a lot of extra money on providing laptops or providing new equipment for users to use at home. Um, they're probably going to be using their own their own stuff. Um, so we then need to look at, well, actually, let's treat the device as hostile and let's actually wrap the security around our data or around our cloud platforms. Um, and that's a very different way of thinking for a lot of organisations. Um, we've seen public sector customers rush to try and get some remote uh, solutions in place. And what they've done is they've done they've done it on a fixed forward basis. They've said, look, we'll get it up and running, we'll get it working will then worry about how we make it secure. And I think that's the world that we're in right now is, is, is working with customers to try and make sure that they have secured that emergency change. So I'm sure you've got something to add to that, Eamon, so I'm going to yeah, stay quiet I, for a second. One, one thing that I just wanted to pick up on, which I know is a, we're, we're pretty passionate about in core, um, was actually that element you touched on there. You know, zero trust, it's the perimeter, it's the date, it's the endpoint in the middle. And not that zero trust changes any of that. But something you touched on really, really, really importantly there was the endpoint itself. So, you know, ultimately, we work with customers a lot on desktop as a service and things like autopilot to, to you know, really make it efficient. You know, and, and unfortunately, we, we both have experience of, of ransomware, uh, the WannaCry some time ago and so on. So, you know, I know yeah. we have uh, have an approach which I'm keen to get your thoughts from the public, from just your general uh, customer experience of, you know, sometimes there's a worry that stuff will or won't get in. Um, you know, we all know at some point stuff will get in. If we have configured the cloud correctly, if we have got the data where it's meant to be, which maybe I'll come back to in a separate question in a second, um, the device can be a little bit more throwawayable. as a word I made up, by the way. But, you know, to, you know, been able to, to, to wipe the device and go on. So the device and the approach to the device, we keep it secure. We use Defender ATP. We do all the things we need to do. But actually, if it gets compromised, there is other ways of handling it. And I know you, but a number of customers have been involved in projects both big and large kind of customers where we've had that approach and it's been a paradigm shift for them in terms of their thinking about the device and how they handle the device. So keen just to get that one piece element of kind of what you've experienced yeah. and why that makes a good user experience because ultimately users just want to be up and running. You know, if they get hit by a fairly major event, we need we need as IT professionals to be able to say, not a problem, we have your data, That's we have the cool stuff, here's your device, go away, have a cup of tea. So probably answer my own question there a little bit, but keen to get your thoughts on that. <laughs> Yeah, so ultimately, um, and I mean, yeah, this is one of the conversations that we've had with customers who have looked at deploying new hardware out to, uh, to their user community in order to support remote working. So ultimately, what we're talking about here is Autopilot, um, which is a, a fantastic, uh, what Microsoft referred to as a modern deployment method for, for devices. So 
Um, uh, Core has been at the forefront of, of, of autopilot, as you well know, Eamon. I mean, we did the first global pilot of the autopilot uh, or of modern deployment technology. It wasn't autopilot back in those days, but in 2016. So this is a bit of technology that we at Core have been uh, heavily involved with since it, it, it kind of first came into being. Um, and one of the things that we have, uh, we've done a number of, of, of deployments with customers where we've set up this autopilot capability so that, uh, and again, it links back to your original statement about doing more with less. Um, ultimately, um, uh, you can now within the, as long as you've got Microsoft Enterprise uh, or Microsoft 365 Enterprise licensing, so E3, E5, um, you have got baked into that the ability for you to no longer have to worry about doing on-premise builds, gold images, anything else along those lines. Um, you've got the ability to actually remotely deploy policies to any device uh, that, that has been issued to a user um, using the autopilot process. So um, we we don't re-image the device. We take control of the Windows 10 operating system that's on the device. Uh, we layer our security policies around it, um, and we then pump down to it the, the Office 365 or other applications that the user needs in order to get their job done. Um, so again, organizations can get rid of storing uh, equipment on site, which enables them to use their real estate more effectively, doing more with less. Um, it enables them to reduce their insurance overhead because they're not storing all this equipment, so doing more with less. Um, and it allows them to do just in time uh, ordering. So we don't, you know, in, in today's world with people working from home, is there any value in shipping a device to the office and then you having to onward ship it to, to the user? No, there isn't. It's just a big time delay. So you know, get the device shipped directly to the user at home, user logs in with their credentials. Um, we then take over management of the device and pump down the applications. Um, the device I'm actually speaking to you on now was one of our internal uh, autopilot pilot devices. Um, and I had my build up. So out of the box, uh, I had Office 365 on my email up and running within 25 minutes. So, I mean, that's a really, really quick turnaround. Um, what this enables you to do in this new world, which again is a huge saving if we are all going to be working remotely moving forward. And I think you ended, you highlighted this in your question. Um, if we have a major problem with the device, if something compromises the device, there's loads of stuff built into Windows 10 that enables us to uh, limit the amount of damage that can do. So using things like Secure Boot uh, to uh, stop uh, uh, some of these things from taking hold if we can reboot or rebuild the device. One of the things that Autopilot enables us to do is completely wipe and rebuild the device in situ while it's at your home. Um, so if the worst does happen, uh, not only will Autopilot actually cut down a lot of the cost and a lot of the time involved in deploying the devices, but in this world, if somebody is hit, if, if uh, a threat manages to make its way through all the different layers of security you set up correctly, um, we have the ability just to nuke the device um, and rebuild it again. Typically speaking, again, the user will be up and running with their productivity apps in 25 to 30 minutes, depending on their internet connection and depending on, uh, you know, what... Um, uh, what they need to function in their job. But, you know, this is a, a level of capability that, you know, we just haven't had in IT historically. Um, yeah. You know, think about what we do with the old, if we had an SCCM based model um, with a, 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 you know, with a, let's say a gold image for argument's sake, um, you know, we're probably talking, you know, three or four hours worth of time with an IT, with actually with the IT team doing it for us. Um, you know, this modern deployment method is just an absolute godsend for any organization that needs to work remotely and needs to manage devices remotely. So um, is there anything that you think I've missed on that? Because I know yeah, that no, you're I as close to that as I am. I so. <laughs> the nugget in there for me is, it's, and I love the way you put it, and I've heard others in core call it, it's kind of the nuke it approach. And it's that practical approach of let's nuke the device, let's, you know, the, the kind of leading into kind of the next topic, the nectar, the, the real cool stuff, the data is what you've protected outside the device. So, you know, nuke it, get it tell, tell people to go for a coffee and come back in half an hour. And we've real world examples of kind of whole departments of, of, of 20 people or whatever, you know, not recently, thank uh, thankfully, where we've just said, guys, we, we wipe the devices, you know, your data secure, uh, have a break and, and you'll be up and running. This thing of been offline for day, weeks or days or, or whatever, it just, you know, trust the, secure, trust the technology, it'll work. And I think that kind of leads me into the point that, you know, the zero trust, uh, it, it we, you know the perimeter has changed the endpoint you know we've got cool technology it's available it's in the license um, but if we were talking about protecting the data we really and this is a bit that I've personally been working with Microsoft uh, over the last two to three months on and that's looking at from the most simplest making sure we were protecting with MFA uh, right through to using some some pretty complicated BYOD stuff um, using Intune and MAM to to protect the the application and, and the data running through it. So 
I think the, the, the point I'm trying to kind of touch on here is the practicalities that we're, we're seeing out there with customers. And also, you know, it's a bit uh, a kind of blunt force to say, just turn MFA on and have an, a massively MFA experience. If needs be in certain areas, that's what you've got to do. But certainly with things like conditional access, cloud access security, we really now have the ability to be intelligent and, and work out what's going on. So keen to hear your view on the technology itself and probably how that's applying to some of your customers and then the practicality of low level basic stuff right through to when the, the more complicated stuff with, with being cognizant that we've got to ask them to do more for less. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, I mean, I think one of the things, so um, we did a recent webinar where we looked at a little bit about how the security perimeter has changed. And, and as we said, we highlighted the perimeter around the office is really, is really not adequate on its own anymore. It should still exist. Um, but ultimately, what we really want to do is we want to wrap a perimeter, a security perimeter around the devices that users are using um, and the data uh, that we hold, whether it's on the device or whether it's in the cloud. And I think that all kind of interplays into, into this uh, this bit of the, the conversation. Um, I will talk briefly about the, I mean, from the device point of view, um, when we do a modern workplace type deployment or we do, you know, we, when we're looking to help customers move into the modern workplace, what we're really interested in doing is managing what can be managed um, and not trying to manage what can't be managed. So if we make sure that the device is as secure as it can be, protected from um, any direct attacks that might want to happen with uh, obviously suitable antivirus software and, and suitable configuration, that means that we can't, uh, you know, that the, we've closed down as many attack vectors as we can, um, then ultimately we're, we're, we're doing as much as we can to protect the devices that's reasonable without getting in the way of the user. Um, but what we can also do then is we can, uh, we can wrap some security around the data. And, and actually, I think one of the biggest strengths of Office 365 and, and not one that anybody really harps on about is our ability to um, actually wrap some data protection around what we're doing. Um, and I won't harp on this too much because I know that you, I think, are doing a webinar on this in the not too distant future. So I don't want to I don't want to steal your thunder. Um, but so we secure the device. Um, all communication between the device and Office 365 is encrypted. So, um, and obviously all the device, all the, any data that we store on the device is encrypted on the device as well. So that's the, the security baseline and the, and the security that we'd wrap around the device itself. Um, what we generally recommend to a customer is that we don't actually really store any, any information on these devices. We store it in OneDrive for Business or in SharePoint. Um, that way then if something happens to this device, it doesn't matter if we have to nuke it and do a redeployment, um, it doesn't matter because all that data is backed up and stored in the cloud. And if I happen to be working on my laptop now, uh, but I have a hardware problem with it and I need to pick up on another machine, all my data is all, all there. I can pick up where I left off and literally, if I was halfway through editing a Word document, um, I can move to another machine and I can pick up exactly where I was. So there's a productivity saving and there's, there's, there's obviously a, uh, you know, a, a very real kind of data, uh, data saving there for the organization as well. Um, so we encrypt the, the, the traffic between the device and, and the cloud. What we can then also do is wrap that security around the, the data itself. Um, and we can do that in a couple of ways. We can wrap the, data, the security around the data in the cloud. So we can put persistent um, persistent data protection on, on, on documents that we have in the cloud, um, which means if somebody does manage to compromise the device, actually it doesn't matter too much because we've got some protection on that data anyway. If somebody exfiltrates some data, it's protected. Um, if we have to share data with somebody outside the organization, uh, which we have to do from time to time in all sorts of different scenarios, um, we can also put some protection around that and limit how long they have access to it for. So, um, you know, using things like um, uh, using things like um, uh, uh, data loss prevention policies to um, ultimately say whenever somebody wants to access that bit of information, we actually want them to authenticate with us. And if at some stage we decide we want to revoke their access, they can't view it anymore. Even if they've stored it on their machine, it's, it's persistent encryption. Um, even if they've got the file stored locally, they still need to authenticate to decrypt it. And if they, if we decide that they can't uh, authenticate, they just can't decrypt it. And, and that has huge uh, benefits, not just to the way that we work with other organizations, but what we do in, in the event of a, um, uh, obviously of a breach as well. So that's one element, but I think, like I say, that's probably something you're gonna go into a bit more depth on in your webinar. So let's not dwell on that. Um, you mentioned obviously about how we can intelligently improve the way that we grant access to whether it's corporate issue device or, or, or other devices. And, and I think there we, we boil down to, uh, we look at things like conditional access, uh, we look at things like you say MFA, but not 
MFA across the piece, maybe do something like risk-based uh, MFA, uh, use the, the conditional access and the risk-based policies uh, to, to control that. Um, and also maybe looking at, uh, at uh, protecting device or protecting information that's in applications uh, on devices that we don't own, so mobile application management. So um, have you got any particular preference where we start with that, or do you want to just go through, do you want to go through it alphabetically? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think the key thing probably that for this session that I think we want to get out there is, is that, you know, you, if I just summarise one or two of the quick things you said there, actually, you know, you, you start from basic stuff uh, and, and I'm, you know, you, you and I both are out with customers talking about what they can and can't do. So you, you take, for example, bottom end of the spectrum, you've got um, the ability to put security defaults on. Um, and when I mean bottom end, just to be clear, I mean kind of a base E3 license. Um, so, but so with the free Azure AD or or, or a P1 as uh, your Active Directory, we can put conditional access on, which means we're protecting who you are, where you've come from, uh, and, and we're good on that. I, I like the fact that you also just touched on probably the other end. So if we got, if you're on an E3 license with uh, the M. Uh, E3 license, which has the, the EMS element built into it. We then get conditional access. We get the Intune MAM policies. And, and I think that's probably practically we're seeing day to day. You know, whether whether organizations liked it or not, there's, they've got devices, BYOD devices out there where they have to um, allow access, but yet we have the kit bag with E3 or M, M365 E3 to protect that. And then the real clever stuff, which yeah, it does need E5 licensing um, and, and heading into the top end of the license, but is that risk-based stuff and, and when you have identity protection. So I think if we summarize between us, that's that's kind of the three areas. There's a huge yeah. amount of detail. And I think one of the things we're doing um, with customers right now is, is, and we're doing this in conjunction with Microsoft, we're running a secure remote workshop. And, and that workshop really is focusing in on what's the identity model? You know, are you using pass to authentication, um, password hash authentication? What's the minimum MFA you should be turning on, and what the, what's the conditional access you can turn on, so that you're you can sleep at night, you know you're secure, which is I suppose the thing that we're really trying to harp on about here, but actually they've got a fairly decent experience. So I think just uh, from a time point of view, I, I think if I conclude, Paul, and then ask you some of your concluding kind of comments, uh, you know, one of the phrases I know you're not keen on is the new normal. Um, and we are in the new normal now. Um, but I think to be clear, to, you know, it's here to stay. Um, and and in a sector that you particularly work in, but you know, both of us work in, you know, there's some interesting expectations that have been set. So if we look at two alone, NHS or, or, or the healthcare in general, um, concept I'm hearing passed around in the last two weeks a lot, for some reason has popped out of nowhere in the last two or three weeks, certainly in my my year shot, is digital front door. Um, you know, and, and do we really back in when we head into winter next year, do we all want to be sitting in or standing in the rain waiting to go into a GP or on a phone trying to get that impossible slot? So healthcare is going to change and i know personally speaking to to some of the nhs organizations they're they're a little bit interested and and, and um concerned about what they have to achieve education for me has been very very interesting um you know for a long time educators have been saying that uh, most of the education or a lot of the powerful education happens outside the classroom um They've literally virtual and online stuff has exploded in the last couple and, and has had some really, I've already seen some bits of research of how powerful it's been, notwithstanding there's been some tra tra uh, problems. So all of that's got to, ha we've had to do that or has, has had to take place in an area where we still need full digital trust. So I think as a concluding comment from you, Paul, I'm very keen to understand what your thoughts on what the next stage looks like and how the public sec sector will have to deal with building or maintaining success because nobody's going to allow them to go backwards. Nobody's going to say, yeah. let's shut off all that virtual stuff. Um, I think it's here to stay and I'm keen to hear how you think that will play out. Yeah, absolutely. No, And, and uh, I mean, I think, again, probably while this is true of the customers in the public sector, it's probably true for a lot of customers in other verticals as well. Um, everybody's rushed to get to, to working in this new paradigm where people aren't in the office anymore. And so, they, as we said earlier, they've taken the steps that they need to in order for things to work. Um, but ultimately, it's been on a fixed forward basis. And what they need to do now is to um, probably, first of all, just make sure they've shored up the banks uh, and that they have enabled the security technology that they're already paying for um, just to, to, to keep everything uh, you know, uh, up together. We've seen a massive explosion in 
um, you know, teams as a product. Uh, you mentioned education. Um, you know, you're, you, I know, I know you're aware, but probably anybody who's watching this talk might not be. Um, you know, Teams has been adopted across the the education uh, estate in the UK. Like, um, you know, it, it's had massive adoption, um, and there are actually some features that are baked into Teams that are available to education customers that have enabled them to, you know, run entire lectures, uh, classes, or, or assessments actually within the Teams product. So, um, and those types of innovations are happening. We've done some projects over the last. 12 months with various different customers, again, in the private and the public sector to help them digitize some of their paper-based processes. The idea behind that was to stop people from having to go from where they work into a central office location to start off a paper-based process. Obviously, that has a completely new set of ramifications in today's world. You know, people might not be traveling anywhere. They might be trying to do that stuff from home. So if they've got the ability to start and digitally track a process, um, using something like Teams or some of the Power App stuff that that, it, that exists, um, that's got to be a, a way forward for them. So I think ultimately, you know, the stage that we're at at the moment is customers have jumped over the first fence, but now what they need to do is to is to you know consolidate, make sure they're secure, but also look at how they can use the technology to take them to the next level and actually make that working from home experience equivalent or better than the working in the office experience. And, and the technology is there to do it. Um, and I think you know the that in its own is 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 a challenge to all organisations. But then on the back of that, you've got other stuff that's happening as well, which is really interesting. Um, and I mean, one of the things that you've mentioned is, um, you know, is is around the healthcare place. Um, for years, there have been uh, the technologies existed that has enabled virtual uh, GP appointments. So, um, you know, there are a couple of partners out there in 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 the Microsoft world that have developed solutions uh, that enable people to securely communicate on a one-to-one -one basis with their uh, GP without actually the GP having to surface their contact details, which obviously if you're on like a Skype meeting, you'd have an email address, you might have a contact card. Um, so, you know, those types of solutions I think are going to get used quite heavily. But of course, in the backdrop of all of that, there's been uh, a, a fairly significant bit of uh, news in the last week or so, um, which is around the, um, and I use the term very carefully, but enterprise-wide agreement for um uh, Microsoft 365 and the NHS, which I think has imagined to be been called N365, um, so which ultimately is, um, you know, a for NHS trusts that haven't currently adopted the cloud or even actually those that have, um, there is now a centralised agreement uh, which enables them to access that technology, maybe upgrade their licences or move to the N365 stack for a significant discount as to what they would have done if they bought it uh, historically. Um, and, you know, I think there have always been two barriers to getting uh, customers in the public sector and particularly in the NHS into the cloud. Um, one of them was around the risk of, of patient uh, data, which Microsoft took care of actually like three years ago uh, when they got their ISB 1596 accreditation, which means that they have the security credentials to hold uh, sensitive data, which includes patient data. Um, and then the other thing was obviously the, the cost of the transition, because there's a certain period of dual running that's involved for an organisation that's moving from the cloud or moving from on premise into the cloud. Um, and I think if, if you know, ultimately N365 is going to address some of that stuff. And I think for the, the, the trust that was struggling to come up with the, the business case to fund that transition, hopefully that's going to help them make that move now. So, um, you know, N365 is going to be a really big development, I think, that's, that's going to see a lot of change happen over the next 12 months or so. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of press and it, it's become more public in the last few days. So I think we're, we're, we're kind of safe to, to talk about N365 for the NHS. A lot of lot of debate and back and forth and really, I think, on a poll. But I, I think for me, it summarizes some of the things we've talked about throughout the session today, which is the affordability. And, and you know, you talked earlier about kind of the experience that maybe some organizations had, you know, ultimately, and the NHS organization is about providing healthcare and not, not an IT organization. So, you know, making sure that the different clinicians, et cetera, can get to email security and so on, work in teams, some really, really powerful advances. And I think entry 65, you know, there's so much we could talk about that one thing. And I think we'll probably come back and do a, a webinar or, or some kind of version of this between us on, on this at a later date. But there is a huge amount in it. But for us, it's about giving the tooling to, to those to those organizations to get onto the cloud quickly and very cost effectively. And I think Microsoft have come to the table very nicely on that. Um, we ourselves, um, 
you know, working with a couple of our partners, we've actually put together something called the Pathfinder program, which is a very quick uh, exercise we do with NHS organisations to actually help them understand how to adopt N365, both technically what are the things they should be looking at, and then secondly, how, how do you pick the licensing, because it's a little bit of a minefield, um, but, you know, quick and simple Pathfinder programs around trying to understand how to get it into N365. So, Paul, I'm, I'm going to just summarise. Um, listen, thanks a million. Um, a lot of good, very good stuff in there today. So it's a good session. I hope everybody watching has enjoyed it. I think for me, the couple of standout points that, and, and there's many that I think we can cover. One, um, those that were cloud enabled got through the experience a little bit better than those that weren't uh, and, and had some of the tooling already there. Um, Putting in Molly, some that weren't cloud enabled had some challenges, you know, and I've seen that from people who had some pretty hairy telecoms experiences and how they made telecommunications still work in, in this remote world. But, you know, what we're really trying to emphasize working ourselves with our customers is even those that are about some of those challenges, the tools are available and they're cost effective in 365 is helping with that. So the tools are there and, and we can put security on without costing a fortune. And that's probably one of the key points. I think one of the things you finished off with there is I, I think we're talking about really, and, and this is maybe a hard thing to say in current climate, but we are actually looking at a very positive experience moving forward that some of the real good learnings from the last six, eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it is, are going to come through. Um, you know, the new norm is now here and, and that practical experience is, is one that we'll kind of build from. I, I think one of the comments that a CIO of a very large organization said to me in, uh, in the last month, and I, I won't name them, but, you know, they said that in the next um, 12 months, 18 months, as leases change, their whole posture around what they do as a business is going to change. Um, they're going to very much look at taking some, some a little bit away from bricks and mortar, which maybe is a different problem, but ultimately they see the investment in technology and people being where their future is. And I think I'm seeing that, and I think you are as well, Paul, seeing that kind of throughout. Um, we are running a set of, set of webinars, and, and by the time this airs, they'll probably all have happened. Um, and those webinars, just for the security point of view, take you through the security posture in general and some of the things customers need to be looking at. We'll focus in on information management in the second webinar, and then the third webinar talks about protecting the device. So um, I highly recommend you go to our website and have a look at that. Um, they will be available on demand. Uh, also, the, the, the uh, survey that we've referenced in today's discussion is also available on the website. Um, so really just ends me to close up with saying, Paul, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. And to everybody else, thank you for watching.